In Pinellas County today, students will be more focused on where they're having class and who they're talking to, not how many kids are sitting in their classroom. They're getting an out-of-this-world phone call from NASA astronauts at the International Space Station. Fifteen lucky students get to talk to those astronauts. Hundreds more get the chance to listen in. Bay News 9's Dally Dangerfield is out at the Science Center of Pinellas County today where that chat takes place. So a lot of excitement, Dahlia. Yeah, there are balloons up. It's a lot of excitement. It's like one big party and the students are a little nervous too. They want to make sure they ask the astronauts just the right questions, but it's really a fantastic opportunity here at the Science Center of Pinellas County. Let me tell you, they're going to be looking at the astronauts right here on this screen and in just a couple of hours, there will be students filling these seats, waiting for that very long distance phone call. I'm Expedition 24 flight engineer Tracy Caldwell Dyson. It's not every day you get a call from space, but today four astronauts will take a break from all that hard work to talk with some very special folks here on Earth. I've never talked to any astronaut before. These seventh graders from Thurgood Marshall Fundamental are a few of the youngsters who get to have that chat with the astronauts little satellite thing right here. And this NASA simulation game is part of the reason why they were picked. Before school started, the science whiz kids spent the summer on school computers maneuvering their own rovers to learn how astronauts control robots in space. It's actually kind of hard. Now the students will get to ask the experts how it's done. The fact that I get to talk to astronauts is really cool. I really do think that's a cool opportunity. Here's a look at the astronauts who are expected to make that long distance call this morning. They'll talk for 20 minutes. I guess I'm kind of nervous because and I think it's pretty cool. Their teacher is hoping it's more than just cool. She wants them to learn from this experience. I want my students to know what kind of technology is out there, how being good in science and math will help them in the future. One thing's for sure, it's a cosmic opportunity that these students will remember for a lifetime. And not only will the students be able to speak to the men and women who are in space, they'll also be able to speak to an astronaut who has returned from space. There'll be an astronaut right here to speak to students today. I'm on scene in Pinellas County, Dahlia Dangerfield, Bay News 9. All right, Dahlia, thank you. We will carry that conversation between the students and the astronauts live a little later on for you this morning here on Bay News 9. Then starting at 1230 today, we'll take an in-depth look at that Mission Space phone call. Bless you. Godspeed. The time now, 1138. We have a special presentation for you. Several hundred Bay Area children having a live conversation with astronauts on board the International Space Station. They're at the Science Center of Pinellas County. We want to bring you that conversation live so that you can listen in. Remember, there will be a brief satellite delay before the astronaut can hear the question. Let's watch. Uh, experiments that it's carried to orbit, including the Hubble Space Telescope. So, and in, in the way of um, you know, when the space shuttle first came uh, came online as part as our workhorse of our space program, uh, you know, we it was it was unusual because it didn't look like a, a regular rocket. It was asymmetric in, in thrust, and uh, we for the first time we were gonna we were gonna take a single vehicle and and use it as a rocket, and then turn it into a spaceship, and then turn it into a glider, all in three different distinct phases of flight, and then reuse it. And uh, that was uh, something that was unheard of back in the early days. And so those are the most significant things that we've learned uh, through the program. And we've been able to build, um, build wonderful things and research platforms in space. And now the space station carrying us to the next level. What we're doing uh, now is flying on six month uh, long duration missions. And um, uh, one of the things we're doing in, in addition to the, our, our research that we're doing is we're, we're replicating uh, the the distance and the time it would take to travel to another planetary body like Mars or, or an asteroid or something. And so, uh, so some of the research that we're doing is, uh, is the research on the human body to be able to, to sustain, sustain life, sustain systems in this long journey to, uh, to an outer planetary body. And, uh, and so that's one of the ways that the space station is going to carry us uh, to the very next level. I'm Indigo Nar. Oh, that was a fail. Hi, I'm Indigo Nar. And how do you communicate with the robotic arm outside of the space station? Indigo, flying the arm is much like playing a giant video game. We can 
communicate via computer, uh, computer commands. I have, uh, when I was flying the robotic arm, I've got two hand controllers that I use, one that does translational control and one that does rotational control, as well as a laptop where I can send commands. And so everything that I, all the inputs I make on the inside are sent via the computer lines to the computer boxes on the arm on the outside, and then the arm performs the motions that I'm requesting it to do. Hello, my name is uh, Cody Kranz, and I just want to know, can an explosion actually happen in space since there's no oxygen? Well, if you're just talking about anywhere out in space, um, you need to have, uh, in anywhere, you need to, uh, to have three things. You need to have an ignition source, you need to have what's called an oxidizer, and oxygen is an oxidizer, the best one actually. So I guess if you were to pick anywhere out into space and say would an explosion happen with no oxygen, uh, unless it had an oxidizer, um, then I, I don't know how it would happen, but certainly um, uh, if uh, you, you have oxygen somewhere out in space or here on board the space station, then there, there is always that potential. And if you're not sure exactly what an oxidizer is, you can just think about those three components, an ignition source and a, and a fuel and an oxidizer is all three people that want to go to a party and have a great time. And um, unless you have those three components, uh, then that party isn't going to happen. And when you get into uh, chemistry, you'll learn more about it there. Hello, I'm Colleen Thomas, and I was wondering what research you are conducting in the medical field. Hi, Colleen. Um, that's a great question uh, because we we really have just gotten the laboratories up and running, and we've got uh, over 130 uh, experiments going on on board. And a couple of things uh, that I'm working on this week are one is a is a is a look at our diet and salt intake. What one of the things that uh, that's uh, kind of a a, 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 a spin-off of of what we're doing in long duration flight is. Uh, the, our skeletal structure and the way that our body uh, leaches calcium out of our bones and we, we have decreased uh, bone density in, in, uh, in our skeletal system, uh, we can look at how, uh, how changing a diet uh, can impact, uh, impact that bone loss and how to maybe stave off uh, things like osteoporosis and things that, uh, that plague us as, uh, as people on earth. And so uh, we, we actually, being up here for a long period of time, our bodies sort of go into an a, a aging process that, uh, with our bone structure, that sort of replicates uh, the onset of uh, an older older age, and we can we can do these experiments with um, with diet to see if we can impact uh, uh, that uh, and, and potentially stave off that type of uh, uh, disease. Also, we're working um, I'm be working the next several days on a, on a fluid physics experiment uh, called Marangoni, which is actually looking at creating a liquid bridge uh, as a conduit to, to transport using just differential temperature with the absence of gravity. Uh, we don't have any convection here and so so we're going to look at a liquid building a liquid bridge and using temperature differential to try to create convection and look at ways to transport uh, optimize the transport of, of, of material through a medium and that could, that could project onto uh, pharmaceuticals uh, transporting through the bloodstream and also uh, energy transporting uh, through, uh, through a medium uh, on earth as well through a power line or something like that. So, um, so those are the two things that uh, stand out in my mind uh, this week that we're working on but we have several experiments that we're working on in the medical field. Hi, I'm Sarah Graves, and I was wondering, does microgravity have an effect to your internal organs, and if so, what are the effects? Sarah, it's actually very interesting what happens to our internal organs. Um, for one thing, without gravity, they may shift around a little bit, so they may not be quite in the same position that they are on the ground. But one of the main things that happens that's very important to us, um, as, as Doug mentioned, our skeletal system loses density, and so does our muscular system. So we lose muscle mass. And the heart, being an internal organ, but it is also muscle, loses mass. And so our heart actually shrinks while we're up here, which is uh, very important to us when we come back, because we need 
need our heart to um, to work with the same endurance and intensity that it than it did before. So that's why actually we do a lot of exercise up here to keep our heart healthy and strong. Um, so it's in good shape when we return. Hi, my name is Jack Scarbo, and my question is, what is the main energy source for the International Space Station? Well, here on this increment, it's wheels whenever he's on the uh, cycle ergometer. Uh, but when wheels goes home, uh, it will be uh, mostly uh, from the sun. We get solar energy that's captured by our gigantic solar arrays that we have on both sides of the space station. And that solar energy gets, create, uh, gets stored and transferred into electrical energy, electrons. And you have electrical energy in your house, and that's how you power all the appliances and your, your stereo and your TV and your computer. And that, what I would say, is our main source of energy here on board the space station. Hello, my name is Andrew Fletcher. Are you doing any research about creating artificial gravity on the space station? Hi, Andrew. Um, well, uh, we're not uh, to creating artificial gravity, but we do have some things. You know, one of the neat things about doing the science that we do here is we take gravity out of the equation. So wonderful things happen and we hope that we uh, we come across some uh, incredible discoveries when we take uh, gravity out of the equation. Uh, but our bodies are used to uh, working and living in gravity and we want to be able to walk when we go back home. So we don't have an uh, experiment that where we're creating artificial gravity, but we do that uh, on a treadmill by using a harness where we pull ourselves down uh, onto the treadmill to sort of replicate uh, our body weight uh, so our leg muscles can continue to work and function so we can walk when we get back home. We also have an exercise device where we create resistive exercise uh, to sort of simulate, again, gravity or lifting weights uh, to try to keep our muscles toned and things like that. And we also have a, a centrifuge uh, on board as well that we use uh, uh, in the creation of our or the, uh, the application of our science. And so uh, we don't have an anti-gravity or gravity room uh, per se, so, um, uh, so we're not working on that in particular, but we do uh, try to replicate that when we're doing our workouts and things. Hello, I'm Denisha, Nisi for short. Are robotics like Robonaut 2 assembled before they go up in space, or is the crew responsible for assembling them once they are on board? Denisha, the answer is it just depends. Um, actually, I honestly think that Robonaut 2 is going to be completely assembled when it comes up, but I don't know how it is packaged. Um, other robots, such as the robotic arms that we have on the outside, the Canadian, Canadian robotic arm, the large arm, as well as the special, special purpose dexterous manipulator, they were not assembled, and uh, crews had to do spacewalks to assemble them outside. So it really just depends on how big the robot is or the robotic uh, apparatus is, because um, it depends on what kind of storage space it, it has to fit in on the ship that's bringing it up here. Hello, I'm Brian Haran. How are robotics being used on the space station? And do you think this will lead to new uses for robotics on Earth? Well, we have a number of robotic arms, and Shannon just mentioned a few of them. We have a very large robotic arm we call the big arm, uh, the Canada arm, too. And it's about, what, 60 feet? about 60 feet long and it has uh, it has uh, uh, six joints seven joints and it can move in uh, in seven degrees of freedom so it's got it can do all sorts of things and it can inchworm its way um, across the space station we also have um, as Shannon mentioned the uh, what do you call that? Special dexter, special purpose dexterous manipulator. We call it SPDM for short, and I like that much better. <laughs> um, and it's and it almost looks like a hand with some fingers that can can uh, do a lot of intricate work. We also have an arm that's a bit smaller than the uh, than the Canada arm too. Here outside of our Japanese module, 
and um, and it's used to move uh, pallets along um, a platform that we have outside where we're conducting external experiments to, to understand the space environment better. And we also have little miniature robots uh, that are inside some of our experiment uh, uh, modules inside the lab here, and they, they're um, placed inside of equipment racks, uh, some experiment modules to help move samples from place to place. And that that's a pretty much summarizes all the robotic arms that we have. Um, we also have some other joint systems that are outside that uh, take some manual um, control in order to operate. But uh, for the most part, um, there's about uh, four, four robotic arms uh, um, in general on the space station. And as far as their uh, new uses on Earth, you know, it's funny that if you think about one of our, um, our uh, most common robotic arms on Earth are uh, uh, cranes. And uh, our robotic arms here on Earth, on, on the space station, uh, mimic very closely a crane. And I'm sure you've seen cranes uh, on Earth as they, uh, uh, at construction sites. New uses, well, right now, I think um, one of the most exciting new uses of robotics is in the medical field. And as we are exploring space and want to go beyond low Earth orbit to, to other planets, uh, it may become useful for um, uh, a, a, to do surgery or, op, uh, or op, uh, medical procedures on someone um, remotely. And it could uh, uh, be through the use of small uh, robotic uh, arms. And um, so that's one of the exciting uses. But um, it doesn't have to be uh, in outer space. It could also apply to Earth in situations like currently what we have with our Chilean miners. If something were to happen to them, we could um, you know, potentially have uh, taken a robotic arm uh, down that small tube and uh, performed a procedure on someone if we didn't have the right expertise down in the mine with them. That's just an example, say, of how the robotic uses on, on orbit here can maybe uh, be led to new uses on Earth. But that's a great question. Hi, I'm Spencer. And what is the hardest challenge you face with the robotics in the space program? Spencer, great question. Uh, well, for me, um, I think it's just, uh, you know, control touch uh, and l learning. Uh, you, you want the robot to be an extension of your of your arms and your hands itself. And so uh, so that's probably the hardest part for me personally is, is in learning to operate the arms is just to to uh, to uh, understand the uh, the control laws of how the thing is operating and then uh, try to mimic that with my own hands and arms and, and, and be able to uh, uh, decipher that in my mind uh, to make sure that you don't get, if you've work, been working with robots, I understand, and so, and so you understand when, when, you're, when you're out of phase with, uh, with, the, um, with the control laws of your robot and uh, uh, it, you can get into an oscillation that, uh, that uh, tends to get worse as you, as you try to over control. So, so, uh, just control touch and control laws are probably the biggest challenge for me. And um, I felt very fortunate when I was outside uh, doing a spacewalk when Tracy and I went outside uh, that uh, I was on the end of the robotic arm and I felt uh, very, very fortunate that Shannon was in control of the, uh, of the robotic arm when I was out there. So, uh, and, and so I've been on the other end of it where, uh, where someone who really knows what they're doing with the robotics <laughs> is in control and it's very, very smooth. So that's a great question, Spencer. Hi, I'm Chris Alenis. Can you see the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico? Actually, we can, or we could, um, when it was there. If we flew over the Gulf during the right time of day, so the sunlight was just right and not at night, of course, we could see the oil uh, on the surface of, of the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico there. It was quite a sight to see. Hi, I'm Hillary, and what types of radiation do you monitor, and what do you do to protect yourself from it? Oh, wow, that's a big question. Um, I think uh, the main source of X, uh, is x-rays, um, and uh, we also monitor uh, so whenever we have solar flares, uh, mostly solar particles that get um, that may come our way. Uh, we have um, a number of ways to monitor uh, radiation exposure. Uh, we have a unit 
that we have inside the module that um, is a detector and it collects any particles that uh, come in and it and it counts them and gives us a reading so that that takes care of what our environment is exposed to inside the space station but each of us have what's called a dosimeter and it's a small little chip that we carry in our pocket and we keep it on us at all times since since the moment we launched into space till the moment that we land and we're going to have this uh, little chip and then we hand it to the smart people who who know how to read them and they get collect all the data and and they can uh, calculate how much uh, exposure we've had um, uh, since we've been in space. And then we also have some uh, smaller dosimeters that actually we've used from our uh, Russian uh, colleagues that uh, we took out on our spacewalk with us. And those actually you can read immediately. So we were able to get uh, information on how much radiation we received once we went out onto our spacewalk and came back in. And that was very helpful. And. Um, can't think of any other radiation forms. Oh uh, yes, we also have radiation protection. Uh, we call them radiation bricks, and uh, they are lining our uh, crew quarters. We each have um, a little bedroom, if you will, a box that we sleep in, and we have the inside uh, lined with these bricks, and they are help to they help to shield radiation that um, would uh, perhaps come through the walls of the space station. So. I think that gives you a pretty good idea of how we uh, monitor radiation and uh, the types of radiation that we're concerned about. Hi, my name is Jonalyn Gordon, and what resources are available on the space station to track the dispersal of the oil spill and the effectiveness of the cleanup op process? Uh, so, I'm not sure I heard your question entirely, but it was what resources do we have to track the dispersal of the oil in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, mostly what we have up here is just visual. We can, uh, and cameras, so we can uh, look with our eyes and see where we see the oil going, and we can take pictures, which is actually very helpful for the folks on the ground to see how the oil is dispersing. Anything under the surface of the water, uh, we cannot detect from up here. We don't have the proper equipment to detect that from up here. Hi, I'm Mallory. Can you hear or feel the sonic boom on launch or re-entry? Uh, that's a good question. I've, I've only uh, been uh, re-entered the atmosphere one time on the space shuttle back a few years ago, um, and I was not able to feel or hear the sonic boom. Um, you can you can feel um, uh, different stages of the re-entry uh, in the way of vibration sort of lateral vibration and sometimes a longitudinal vibration and um, so you can't hear the sonic boom and uh, definitely can't hear it during the launch uh, sequence because of the um, the other noises going on around you so um, and the vibration the vibration as well so um, I have to say that the um, I've launched one time on the space shuttle now and one time on the Soyuz rocket and the uh, the space shuttle um, uh, in um, in the first stage and I think Probably some of it's because of the um, because of the asymmetry that you're actually sitting a little bit uh, displaced from the center of thrust. Um, is uh, the vibration is uh, 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 fairly uh, a lot greater than in the in the Soyuz uh, uh, rocket, but uh, you can't hear the uh, sonic boom. Okay, S space station. We really appreciate this. It's been awesome. Teaching from Space Partnership, the NASA Education, the Science Center, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And God Watching three astronauts on board the International Space Station speaking live to hundreds of students in a St. Petersburg Auditorium there at the Science Center of Pinellas County. Now, 15 students actually got the privilege of being able to ask those astronauts, and just to mention their names, uh, Doug Wheelock, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, and Shannon Walker. Those are the three astronauts. 15 students got the chance to ask those questions because of work they did this summer. Many of those questions, as you heard, focused on automation and robotics, a big division for NASA. Well, those students studied automation and robotics and marine science over the summer. They completed special projects. That's what gave them that privilege. But more than 200 students from different schools all over the Bay Area were in the audience at the Science Center. So stay with us at 1230. We'll go in depth with more on this Mission Space phone call that's coming up in less than 30 minutes. Stick around with us for that.
Innovation and the sciences, two cornerstones of advanced and industrialized nations. America's been lagging behind in recent years, but there's one sure thing that can engage students to study. Two, one, booster ignition and liftoff of discovery, celebrating its 25th birthday by racking up science and supplies to the space station. Reaching the stars has captivated this country for decades, and you need that sense of wonder to maintain high levels in academics. Well, today we're going in-depth on a program determined to keep students hooked on learning. That program has some lofty tutors as well. This morning, hundreds of middle schoolers had the chance to speak with NASA astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Bainers Ryan's Melissa Eichmann was there, joining us now with more on this out-of-this-world experience. Hi, Melissa. Al, definitely very exciting. A day in out of the classroom and a, quite a field trip for a lesson that will definitely be out of this world for hundreds of students. Hundreds of students from about eight area schools gathered at the Science Center of Pinellas today and talking to them, three astronauts right from the International Space Station. The children had about 20 minutes to ask their questions, and the kids I talked to say they were thrilled to be part of this cosmic question and answer session. Uh, oh my goodness, just, just talking to the astronauts and be, being able to have that opportunity was real amazing. I'm, I mean, not everyone gets to have this opportunity and have this chance. So to be able to do this, not even in person, and them being in outer space for that matter, floating around, was just absolutely phenomenal. Quite an opportunity for these students. Now the children were picked based on teacher recommendation and some of them were part of the summer camps here at the Science Center. Now again, about 300 kids here today hearing straight from the astronauts at the International Space Station. A very exciting day and quite a long distance call for these kids. In St. Petersburg, Melissa Eichmann, Bay News 9. Thank you, Melissa. Now, I also had the chance to sit down with Joe Cuenco of the Science Center of Pinellas County to talk about the NASA program and how to keep students interested in math and science. How did you land this? Because obviously they can't do this with every school in the country or with every science center in particular. Uh, it, it took us a good deal of work. Uh, our third proposal, three times was, was a charm. Uh -huh. The third proposal was accepted. And um, it was very exciting because as we were putting the program together, you know, we, we talked about, uh, what we proposed to NASA that we would have middle school students actually engage in, in several lesson plans. Because the whole intent, the reason why NASA does this is that they have their teaching from space office and they also have NASA education office. NASA education is, is really interested in promoting STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Oh, yeah, for, yeah. For K through 12, as well as for college students. But they're using this opportunity to, to really do something stimulating and engaging for students. And so they also want both students and educators to use the resources that are on their website. So we proposed to NASA that, that students would go on and do a robotics program yeah. uh, and also do a, a, a marine science research project related to weather. And so once they completed those lesson plans and, and, and got to tour the NASA site and see all the resources that they had there, yeah. then they would actually uh, submit a couple questions to us that we would put together, pick the best ones, and then submit that to NASA to see if, you know, if we would get accepted. And, and given our situation uh, with the Science Center mm -hmm. uh, and the fact we have great reach and a great relationship with the Pinellas County School System, you know, they said, you know, this is the call you want to receive, this, you're selected and you get 20 wow. minutes. And that's, and that's what the Science Center is trying to do is because the, the school district can't do it all. And to think right. that they can is, you know, is crazy. And so the Science Center trying to augment with these great ideas. And you know, you talked about, see you and I and a lot of other people, we're so used to seeing that shuttle going up every four, five, six, six months. Well, when that goes away, which eventually it will, you still have to keep the fire in the belly of these young kids to keep them interested in science, don't you? It's heartbreaking to see our, our astronauts go up on the Soyuz and come down in a capsule. Yeah. You know. So you're you're right, Al. Actually, the and I know how how much of a fan you are of the you know of space, and um, the fact that I, I think you had mentioned to me that you were actually on one of the shuttles. You got to ride. Well, yeah, sit, yeah. Sit, sit, sit in one of the cockpits. Sit in the shuttles. Okay. That's right. I didn't <laughs> right. fly. No, I know. Yeah. Clarify. But you know, so we know. So NASA is trying to stimulate and keep students engaged not only in space exploration, you know, but space biosciences right. as well as robotics other aspects of space you know they, they say that a dollar invested in NASA yields six or seven dollars in return sure but NASA's objective is not only to stimulate education you know stem education but also stimulate 
and continue the interest in sciences and also technical careers. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the things we've talked to several astronauts on here uh, from the Clearwater mm -hmm. area, uh, Andy Allen and uh, um, also the gal from, uh, the woman from uh, Clearwater High School, uh, Nicole, and, and just want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and want to kind of uh, keep that mm -hmm. emphasis. We really still need, uh, we need those science and math kids for our future, don't we? Absolutely. You know, when, when you think about, uh, there's a Boston Consulting Group study that said that, that uh, America, U.S. ranks eighth in innovation behind Singapore number one. You know, it, it's scary when you think about how right. our students compare in the 30 to the 30 globalized countries. You know, we're 17th in science and, and 23rd in math. Yeah. And according to the Board of Governors and Board of Legislators report, we can't compete like that. And so that's why programs such as this are very important. The other things that we're doing at the center, uh, our cybersecurity program, mm -hmm. uh, forensics, robotics programs, these are astrophotography. These are things that, that we, we hope would engage students and keep them interested. And while they're having fun, you can teach them math. You can teach them science. Yeah, unfortunately, we are still too much of a society where we think that the only way you can make it big is, is to be a billionaire in business or to be a rock star or a football player or a basketball player, when in reality, our future is going to be very dependent upon what kind of engineers and scientists we develop. Absolutely. You know, we, we talk to our students and say, engineers are cool. You yeah. know, we, we love geeks, yeah. you know, but uh, actually there's a, also another issue is that there are 8%, 9% of the female graduates are going into engineering. So that's, that's a, a huge discrepancy. We mm -hmm. need more female graduates in, in, in engineers, and we also need uh, better representation with the, with the underserved. You've yes. got a big fundraiser coming up. It's called what? Wine Underneath the Stars. And when is that? Coming up this uh, September 18th. 18th. Yeah, yes, the 18th. Thank you. Yeah. If folks want to go there, they can get tickets, right? Can, how, how do they get the tickets? Uh, you can order online or you can call, you know, in advance. But we appreciate, you know, this is a fundraising, yep. something that we use to help us support and continue the, the, the growth in education. Yeah, and one of the astronauts that we've had on here a lot, Andrew Randall, is going to be one mm -hmm. of the speakers. Funny guy, but also extremely intelligent. Yes. The Science Center of Pinellas operates on donations, grants, and gifts. And as Joe mentioned in our interview, the Science Center is hosting one of its big annual fundraisers. It's called Wine Under the Stars on the night of September the 18th. For tickets, check out our website, baynews9.com. We posted a link in our Scene on 9 section. And that'll do it for today's In Depth. Some Pinellas County kids will definitely have something to chat about at the dinner table tonight, a once in a lifetime learning experience. Some students have the chance to talk with astronauts at work. Bay News 9's Melissa Eichmann takes you to outer space for the story via the Science Center of Pinellas County. We have you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Welcome aboard. Some 300 Pinellas County students got to head out of this world for quite a science lesson today and participate in a cosmic Q&A with three astronauts straight from the International Space Station. I was wondering, does microgravity have an effect to your internal organs? And if so, what are the effects? Our heart actually shrinks while we're up here, which is uh, very important to us when we come back because we need our heart to um, to work with the same endurance and intensity that it, that it did before. So that's why actually we do a lot of exercise up here to keep our heart healthy and strong. What is the main energy source for the International Space Station? We get solar energy that's captured by our gigantic solar arrays that we have on both sides of the space station. A lesson these students will never forget. To be able to do this, not even in person, and them being in outer space for that matter, floating around, was just absolutely phenomenal. Learned a lot about the actual the program itself and how everything actually happens in space. It's, it's, it's exciting. The Science Center says this is a rare experience for students. It's very limited. We, it's like it's it's. We won the space lotto today. Not only did the students get to talk with astronauts straight from the International Space Station, they also got to interact with a couple right here on Earth. Two astronauts at the Science Center also answered questions. And it will help develop that next generation of scientists, engineers, and astronauts uh, that we desperately need in this country. And it's working. Pursue a career in like NASA or go into space, become an astronaut. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. In St. Petersburg, Melissa Eichmann, Bay News 9. All right, this is one of many events aimed to get children interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. For more information about the Science Center of Pinellas County, we have a link for you at baynews9.com. All you have to do is click on the seat on 9.